Ladies and gentlemen, I have a treat for you today. Uh, Dr. Dennis R. McDonald, who is a scholar of New Testament and Christian origins, uh, who is best known for comparing the Gospels to the Homeric epics like uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, Dr. McDonald, welcome to the program. Well, thank you, Derek. Nice to meet you. So briefly, I want you to tell me, Dr. McDonald, who are you? What do you do? What are you best known for? And what does your work tell us about the genre of the Gospels? I know that's kind of a three-part question, but if you can get all those in there, I want to dig right in. Um, well, I'm a, a former fundamentalist. My father was a fundamentalist Baptist pastor. And uh, I'm actually a graduate of Bob Jones University, which I attempt to call Bob Jones versus Unity, um, and uh, was uh, uh, eager to uh, save the world for Christ. So um, I uh, translated the entire New Testament for myself from Greek before I went to seminary. Um, I went to Princeton um, Theological Seminary, the uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, graduated from McCormick Seminary and got a PhD from Harvard in 1978. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was committed um, no longer to fundamentalism, which I found outrageous. Um, and um, I actually... Uh, too patriotic and violent and misogynistic and racist for my tastes. Um, but I was still committed to the Christian uh, movement. And so I taught at Goshen College, the Isle of School of Theology, the uh, Claremont School of Theology. But I also taught um, as a visiting professor at Harvard University, uh, Florida State uh, University, and uh, Yonsei University in South Korea. So I uh, understand myself to be a classicist, um, but of uh, relatively modest abilities. Namely, I'm uh, more interested in language, in um, mythology, in Greek poetry than I am in other topics of uh, classicists, such as archaeology um, or politics, uh, um, martial arts, uh, music, and even philosophy, although my minor at Harvard was in Greek philosophy. Um, during the time that I was uh, teaching, um, I became interested in the apocryphal Acts of the Apostles and published on the Acts of Paul, then on uh, several books on the Acts of Andrew, and it was working on Andrew where I saw so much Homeric imitation and Platonic imitation um, that I thought this is really unusual and uh, sui generis that is unique among early Christian texts. But then I started to see that the Gospel of Mark has this same thing going on. The, then the Acts of the Apostles does. Then the Gospel of John is emphasis is imitating Euripides' Bacchae. Then Jewish texts, even before that, were imitating Greek poetry. Third Maccabees imitates the Bacchae. Um, Poe Tobit imitates the, Ili the uh, Odyssey. Um, and it goes on and on. And this was... Um, uh, entirely new to me, and I was not trained to do this uh, at Harvard uh, for my work. But when I was there, I made friends with a very important Homeric scholar. Um, Albert Lord was a, a specialist in Homeric epic, and he and I became really quite good friends. And um, uh, he was considerably older than I. He's been gone for a long time, but his work, Singer of Tales, is still very much worth reading. Um, and he encouraged me, he said, why is it that New Testament scholarship is so tone deaf to the most important uh, literature that was um, defining Greek uh, culture and after it with Virgil, uh, the Aeneid? Why can't it get its act together? And he said, you ought to uh, see if that you can correct that. And during my career, I've had one Eureka after another after another. And I haven't found all the parallels, Derek. 
I'm still looking for them and uh, encouraging. Now, by the way, that doesn't mean that Jesus is a myth for me. And in fact, have, being able to eliminate these mythological pieces from the Gospels allows one to see the Q document. And if you don't like Q, at least you could say mem uh, memories of the historical Jesus clearer. We, we know now um, uh, better than we ever have that once we can re, uh, eliminate this mythology, we find a, uh, a Jewish reformer who I liken to Cesar Chavez or Martin King, um, who's trying to reform Judaism and loses his life because he's causing so much uh, trouble. So that's more than you wanted. I don't even know that I answered your question, but we started. You, uh, you, you did, though, because I think toward the end there, what you said goes to show us that the Gospels are essentially mythologized history, that the, this yes, is all right. legendary and mythological embellishment upon some shade of a personage from way back when. Would you say that's right? Oh, that's very well put. Uh, and by the way, uh, Unless someone is uh, some form of fundamentalist or uh, an Orthodox, uh, Greek Orthodox or Russian Orthodox or various Orthodox groups or conservative Catholic, um, people know that the Gospels were mythologized, uh, that Jesus was mythologized. But usually people who still identify themselves as Christian think that these are symbolic stories or that they are a part of um, naive Christian folklore, uh, like Rudolf Bultmann and most form critics, you know, they just didn't know any better. We're smarter. We can demythologize them and uh, get out the real, the real truths. But in my view, the real truths are in the mythology itself. It's counter mythology. It's not counter, um, you know, the, the, the popular stories of Jesus that were uh, transmitted uh, naively by uh, fishermen. Now, Dr. McDonald, isn't what you're doing, because this is what the critics say, right? Isn't what you're doing parallelomania? What do and, you I would say, and I would say they have parallelophobia. <laughs> They have parallelophobia. If you look at Greek rhetorical um, education, they're doing mimesis all over the place. Um, they're not afraid of parallels. They, in fact, understand parallels to be the way you get new cultural energy. So um, if you, how would you be a scholar of Virgil's Aeneid and not be uh, parallel, um, doing parallelomania? The parallelism's all there. Now, you, it, we don't know exactly what uh, texts he had in mind uh, or the passages he had in mind, but my discipline uses parallelomania to disguise its own parallelophobia. Hmm. Hmm. I like that. I like that. And I, I do comparative religion myself, so... Uh, I am. I can very much relate <laughs> to parallelophobia. I see it all the time. Um, what would you say are the, your two favorite examples of mimesis uh, in in the Gospels in the New Testament? Um, I suppose the one from the Odyssey would be the story of the Gerasene demoniac. Um, and uh, Jesus turning so, uh, soldiers into swine, which is similar to the story of uh, Odysseus and Polyphemus, who, who encounters a savage who lives in a cave. Um, and uh, then uh, the Circe story, where Circe turns soldiers into swine. Odysseus rescues them, but in the end, these uh, these uh, uh, comrades of Odysseus all die in the sea. They drown. Um, the one that I like from the Iliad is the death of Jesus and the death of Hector. Um, Hector, uh, before he dies, realizes his god Apollo had abandoned him. He dies with a shout, and uh, then there's the rending the veil, which is like a threat against his foes. 
three women watch from a distance. And uh, Hector um, has three women lead the laments. Andromache, his wife, Hecuba, his mother, and Helen, his, his uh, sister, sister-in-law. Uh, 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 Joseph of Arimathea has to rescue the corpse of Jesus from his killer, that is, uh, from uh, Pilate. Um, and that's what uh, Priam had to do to rescue Hector's body from Achilles, a very famous story. The difference, of course, is that uh, Jesus rises from his grave and, um, and uh, Hector does not. But I have I have lots of different uh, favorites, so uh, I'm sure I have to be, uh, be very highly selective. And as you said, you know the the New Testament authors, these these gospel authors, and probably even Paul, um, they would be familiar with, they would be conversant with uh, this material. They would have that Greek educational background, would they not? Oh, if they knew how to read Greek, they'd been exposed to Homer. Now, they probably didn't know all of Homer, maybe only Iliad Book One. But um, uh, he, he was, he, Hegel put it well, uh, Homer was the oxygen that Greeks breathed. It was in their art. It was in their theater. It was in their music. It's in their um, uh, literary imitations. Um, and it was an honor to imitate Homer and to show your own cleverness. Uh, by the way, I understand that you are interested in history of religions and uh, early Christianity. Mm -hmm. I want, I think it might be useful to have me say what I think of the history of religions movement and how it relates to mimesis. Please do. I would not at all deny the importance of history of religions. But what I find is the history of religions is more subjective than it needs to be. And that you don't have necessarily textual connections so that what you have are more generic similarities between mythologies and not literary genetic connections between mythologies. So one of the things that I think was is fascinating, and I'd love to have more of a discussion of this with anyone, including you, mm -hmm. is um, why shouldn't we welcome mimesis, which allows us to, to target the particular uh, antitexts or, uh, or mythological texts and see how they get recrafted now, that's not to say that history of religions is useless. It's just to say that it sometimes does not is not able to draw lines between one myth and another so that it, it stays in kind of a genetic category mm -hmm. instead of, uh, I mean, a generic category instead of a genetic one where we know what the textual ancestor was of a particular story. So I think it can be a both and. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I just would like uh, people who are interested in the, the kind of thing you do, um, which is more history of religions, to welcome mimesis criticism because it allows for a little more stability in the methodology. Amen to that. And, and, and uh, I appreciate what you say, because I'm always careful to make the distinction between a genealogical comparison and an analogical comparison in which there's not necessarily a genetic connection. But I, I still think that even the analogical comparisons tell us something important about the ancient world and about the kind of um, about the kind of mythic phenomena to which ancient Mediterranean peoples were prone. Well, I think that's probably true, but I also think we need to have a little Joseph Campbell thrown in there as well. That is a more Jungian understanding of uh, the mythic patterns and how they um, hit the the human psyche and, and societies very deeply. So um, it, uh, th that makes it really m more uh, generic. 
Um, it, it has to do with the way that uh, mortals uh, like us um, make sense of the world by using mythology and narrative to do so. So I, I think all of these projects are right. For example, in classes, I frequently start with Joseph Campbell, and then I go to history of religions and to show that you have these analogs. And I like that word actually in this context. But then you have genealogical relationships. I like that word that's used too. And so this business about um, mythology needs to have its own taxonomy, its own um, categories for uh, interpretation. I am sure that we could talk for hours, although this is just an introduction to your course. So uh -huh. we do have to wrap things up. But Dr. McDonald, um, two more questions for you. Number one, what is the name of the course and where can people go to sign up? Uh, Derek, I'm going to let you answer that question. Derek, pop on in here. Derek, Derek number two. Derek, Derek, number, Derek two. number one. Yeah. Number two. <laughs> hey, hey guys so um the link will be in your description derek and uh, you can pin that at the top of the uh comments down below uh, you'll have a specific link that anybody who signs up through they're helping you a theologica and of course it helps the academic dr dennis mcdonald so you have a unique link specifically for your uh sign you know so they could sign up to that link and what is the title of the course um, we called it one eye on Greek. How did it go, Dennis? You said uh, reading, reading the gospels. Reading the gospels with one eye on Greek poetry. I love it. I love it. One and last question, Doctor McDonald. On course, by the way, yeah. <laughs> one last question. I understand you have a cabin there in California. Yes. Um, I'm going to need you to send me the key, and I want us to treat it kind of like a profit share, except I don't want to pay anything. Uh, I just want full access to it. Is that cool with you? <laughs> well, you'll have to talk to my wife, who actually owns it, and, <laughs> and uh, she's and she's in the process of selling it. So it, we still have no! it. For another, no, no, we still have it for a number another seven months or so. But right. uh, we're we're aging. We don't get up there very much. And yeah, okay. Well, Derek, pleasure to meet you. Good question. Absolutely, folks, get in on this course with one eye to the Greek poetry of the ancient world and how that finds its way, weaves its way into the New Testament with Dr. Dennis McDonald. Once again, thank you so much, Dr. McDonald. Derek, a pleasure. Yeah.